Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We are here for our fourth episode of CTV Unplugged with Coffee and Conversions. Welcome back, Andrew and Jackie. Welcome back to the couch. And welcome back, Coffee Insiders. And thanks again for joining us today. Um, today, we are going to be talking a little bit more about CTV Unplugged and future trends in CTV for 2024. Um, I want to send a big thank you to Giovato for allowing us to record in their beautiful studio, Studio G340. Shout out to Giovato and team. Um, thanks, everybody, again for, for coming back. Uh, if you're not a Coffee Insider already, please make sure that you sign up. And let's dig in. So this is actually the second time I'm seeing you guys this month, right? We were all at a wonderful event hosted by the MCNY Marketing Club of New York earlier this month to listen to the annual Outlook with Bruce Beagle from Winterberry Group, right? Um, and during that event, they actually covered some pretty interesting topics around CTV, and we're going to dig into some of that today. Um, so let's take a recap of where we are so far. So episode one was really all about understanding uh, CTV and navigating that landscape. Episode two was really all about creative strategies. Three was really the science behind CTV. And today we're here to talk about future trends. Um, so if you want to ever catch up on any of those episodes, just check out our YouTube channel or go to the focususa.com website and it'll all be available there. Um, so today we're going to continue that conversation. So let's talk marketing. Um, so when we talked about the CTV and how impactful that was at the Bruce Beagle event, mm -hmm. um, here are some takeaways from the report. CTV marketing spending was up 20.1% in 2023, according to the recent report by Winterberry Group. That's $25.4 billion. There should be a QR code on your screen if you guys want to have access to that report. Um, a little more. So increasing the need for spend for data infrastructure, that is up 7.3% to $31.7 billion. And Winterberry is also predicting continued growth with, a, with another 30.4%. That's $33.1 billion by the end of this year. Um, so guys, like what did you think of that report overall? So I thought that the Winterberry group um, and their team put in a lot of effort to you know, give us those numbers. There was a lot of research behind it to provide us that. But I do think overall that report was very insightful and bringing it back to our episode one where we talked about the growth of CTV. We're right in line with where he and his team have discussed. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that it is going to grow tremendously like they talked about. And there are a few events this year that are gonna play a major role, which we'll talk about today with it. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I would just piggyback off of that. I think, you know, it was a really great presentation that they provided. Um, and, you know, a lot of the research, there's different, you know, there's different sources of this data, but the one commonality, regardless of where you're getting your data from, is that connected TV is growing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and what I really appreciated about their research is not only did they tell you what they think is going to happen, uh, but they also talked about why. So what are the macroeconomic trends that are resulting in these um, media uh, changes uh, in the future, right? What, what those predictions that they're making? Data infrastructure, uh, connected TV growth, uh, the shift from traditional to digital media. Those are larger secular trends mm -hmm. uh, that are a result of consumer behaviors changing. And um, when it comes to the overall uh, growth of uh, media investment, that is largely driven by the macroeconomic factors that are going on, um, whether that be due to the, the wars that are going on, whether that be due to the uh, raising interest rate environment. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it was pretty good to hear the context behind it rather than just providing those predictions. Yeah, no, that's a great event. Again, shout out to MCNY for hosting that event every year. Um, by the way, membership is free for MCNY, so if you're in the New York, New Jersey area, be sure to check out the club. It's a wonderful resource for marketers. Um, so let's dive in. I'm going to put you guys in the hot seat. You ready? Ready. <coughs> you ready? Here we go. <coughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so picking up in our conversation from October, that's the last time Andrew was here. Andrew, welcome back. Thank you. Right? Two-time you guest. You're, you've made it to, uh, <laughs> to the couch twice. Um, so back in October, we talked about... Um, you know, and 
based on based on our conversation from October, coupled with the stats that we just heard from uh, Bruce Spiegel last week, the main trend in 2024 that we're seeing is that linear TV spend will continue to shrink and CTV inventory will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And that's going to reframe the market. Right. So what has been new since we last spoke about the emerging signals that support that trend? Yeah, no, it's um, it's crazy, right? Because we just last spoke in October. It seems like yesterday, but yeah, and that was so, a long time. So ago. much has changed since then, right? Yeah. And and it's it's really incredible just how rapidly uh, the connected TV landscape is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's you have to keep track of it literally on a daily basis. Uh, but what is you know good about the timing of our conversation is that the last time we spoke about some trends which have since really accelerated and come to fruition, right? So the last time we uh, had spoken, we were talking about things like live sports and how that's made the transition from traditional media over to streaming. And you see the biggest headlines of late have been Peacock with their first ever NFL playoff uh, only streaming game um, and how much that, uh, you know, that had led to an increase in uh, subscriber growth Netflix just recently announced that they had an exclusive deal with WWE. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of movement in that. And all of these trends are, you know, a result of one another, right? So because consumers are choosing to view TV via streaming versus traditional, cutting the cord, um, which has accelerated, mm -hmm. uh, the ad dollars have, um, you know, followed them. Right. And so um, what we see on the screen here is just a, a visualization of how much the investment has continued to grow in connected TV ad dollars and has uh, steadily declined in linear TV ad dollars. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things that we had talked about last time was how for the first time uh, uh, cable and broadcast were less than 50 percent of all viewership. Uh, and you know, streaming took over as the main way that consumers in America watch TV. Um, since then, uh, a, a new landmark that we hit was that for the first time in November of 2023, ad-supported video on demand had more downloads, uh, more subscriber growth than subscription-based video on demand, mm -hmm. right? So that's like the difference between Netflix with ads and Netflix without ads. Uh, all of the major streaming providers, Netflix, Disney, um, you know, Peacock, uh, all of them have increased the uh, price of their most expensive premium tier while they've maintained a low rate for their ad supported tier. And, you know, you have that combined with Netflix cracking down on password sharing mm -hmm. and you have, um, you know, live sports moving over to streaming. And that's where you're seeing a lot of the growth come from uh, in both in terms of ad supported growth, in terms of ad revenue, as well as. Uh, the continuation of the cord cutting. Yeah. Well, that's what's so interesting is you would think with the increased prices, the consumer market would be pushing back on that. But no, that's just how you watch TV now. So the adoption rate of all of these things is continuing to increase and grow. So Jackie, like from your perspective, and I'm hoping you can frame this from like a client perspective, mm -hmm. someone who's actually buying media space on these, um, on these platforms, how are your clients actually adapting to some of these trends as they're taking hold and are there any trends that you're seeing from the client side of the street? Right. So even since our last conversation um, back in October, I think that our clients have piqued more interest in regards to what is CTV, whether they are seeing it in a personal level of in their home and watching, say, the games that they're now being able to stream or um, us just having conversations with them when we meet with them. But they they peak interest. They have, they want to know more about the opportunities. They want to know about the measurability, which we'll get into later in this conversation. So really now, um, more recently, we're seeing our clients either drift away from linear completely and really focus on CTV because of the, the capabilities of the targeting aspect of it, or they're completely, or they're staying half and half. So they're still on linear, because they've been doing it, mm -hmm. but they want to see what CTV can do. They want to see wh what they've been doing and if they added it where it could benefit them. 
is it an additive resource? Is it worth the hype? Kind of, right? They're, yeah. they're testing the waters. Right. A lot of them are. I mean, a lot of them have seen a lot of um, different improvements in their strategy with mm -hmm. it. So it's also shifting to that data mindset, right? Like shifting from like that measurability side, which is a lot more, right. it, it can open a lot of doors. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Or Well, yeah, I think that, you know, the biggest takeaway is that connected TV and streaming have gotten to a point where clients can no longer ignore it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they're seeing uh, the decline in their linear TV uh, viewership, right? Mm -hmm. All of the ratings are down yep. across the board, right? Uh, I know I sent you um, uh, some stats about like the, the Emmys <laughs> and how like- Andrew with his stats. <laughs> we'll send them to the audience, I promise. <laughs> it's, ju it's just an, it's a good visualization, right? Because yeah. historically the Emmys, um, you know, it's a live event. Everybody watches it on linear cable TV. Mm -hmm. Well, what you see from what's trended in terms of the viewership, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, it was 17 million viewers. This past year, it hit an all-time low of 4 million viewers. It's a huge drop-off. Yeah, and it's like the, you're just not getting the same reach with your linear buy as you used to get. And so, well, what's going on with the viewers that used to watch TV? Overall, TV consumption is not declining. It's just migrating from traditional TV to connected TV. And I think clients are, uh, even ones that are, you know, have historically only done traditional, um, maybe they were very hesitant potentially to move over. Uh, some are skeptical regarding uh, digital just because it's new. Mm -hmm. uh, even those clients we're seeing are coming to terms with the fact that if they don't use connected TV, then they're missing out on a very large percentage of the audience. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's one of the things that uh, has ultimately uh, gotten to that inflection point. Yeah. And, and the learning curve, right? You know, you're missing out on this time where everybody's learning mm -hmm. um, and testing different audiences. Um, so, okay. How many people um, are streaming their live sports these days, right? So, like, another headline everyone is talking about is Peacock's first ever live streaming only on the NFL playoff game. Yeah. Right? Like, I don't know. I think this is a polarizing question. <laughs> oh, I know, Jackie, uh, you had mentioned that you were one of the uh, yes. people that had to sign up for Peacock. Yes. And Jackie's face, guys, just said it all. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. they're, they're getting me at every angle. <laughs> <laughs> so... With over 23 million viewers, the word on the street is that that broke a couple of records, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the shift from live sports to streaming platforms, it seems like the signal is that that trend is here to stay. Um, and with platforms like Apple TV+, Plus, YouTube TV, and now Amazon Prime Video, um, like that just entered the game pun intended. Um, how is this shift from live sporting events to streaming platforms going to further impact linear TV um, and streaming and the streaming advertising ecosystem? Like, what is that going to look? That's part one of my question. Go. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a it's a great question, um, and you know, one of the things that they actually talked about during the Winterberry presentation mm -hmm. was they called it the live sports moat. Uh, yes. which I thought, I've never heard that before, but I thought it was very clever because yeah. it makes a lot of sense, right? So 23.5% um, of all linear viewers mm -hmm. um, between the ages of 18 and 49 uh, are watch live sports. Um, that's the main reason why a lot of people still have cable. But when, you know, and that was sort of the last stand, right? Um, but with it, with the transition of all of these major streaming uh, services, striking deals uh, with, the, with the major sports uh, you know, organizations, uh, it is really cracked that last moat. Mm. And what's I think really important about the Peacock, um, the Peacock first ever playoff streaming only uh, game is that it's that last part, streaming only. Yeah. So the reason why uh, 2.8 million people uh, had to sign up for Peacock was because they had no other way to watch the Dolph Dolphins game. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, that'll be very interesting to watch if that continues to be a trend, right? So, for example, the uh, Netflix deal with WWE, I believe that's also exclusive. Mm 
So if you're a WWE fan and you don't have Netflix, well, that's the only way you're going to be able to watch it. And so, you know, where I see this going, um, which will create both challenges and opportunities for advertisers, is I do expect there to be more of those exclusive deals. Uh, you know, I do expect there to be more of those Amazon Prime Video Thursday Night Football deals, where, you know, they are seeing that because, and Peacock's a great case study for it, um, when you only are able to watch a particular game, especially something like NFL playoffs, uh, on the streaming app, people will, you know, people will, whether they're happy or not, they'll grin and bear it, and they'll, uh, they'll download and subscribe. Right. So, uh, to support their team, you, right. you have that emotional impact for it. So I guess, well, you answered part two of my question, which was, you know, the opportunities and challenges that this is going to continue to present. I think it's all we're going to have to watch the consumer very closely, right, and see what they're telling the market as well, because I think eventually I, I think that's going to have an impact. Well, I think that, you know, what's going to be really interesting is to see, all right, how many of those 2.8 million people that subscribe to Peacock will just immediately cancel? Right. How many will, how many will stick around? Yeah. Right? One way or another, it's a success because some percentage of them will stick around. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, that was the largest ever one day uh, streaming uh, signups, uh, 2.8 million people. Uh, so, you know, that's clearly a sign that that works. Mm -hmm. um, but why I think this leads to a bigger question around consolidation uh, is if that's going to be the case where they have more of these exclusive deals so that way you can only watch, for example, uh, the MLS or the MLB if you have Apple TV um, Plus. Uh, well, then people are going to have to have multiple streaming services if you are fans of multiple sports, mm -hmm. right? And then the question then becomes, well, you know, how many are people willing to subscribe to, especially if they start cracking down on password sharing? Big deal with Netflix, right? Like, yeah. especially if they're going to get into the, the sports game. I, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so in terms of, like, just to challenges and opportunities for advertisers, well, the challenges are obvious because, you know, you used to be able to call up the, you know, three or four major networks, and, you know, when you're running a... You want to run during the NFL, you call up NBC, you call up CBS, you call up Fox and you book your deal. Mm -hmm. Now, with the proliferation of different streaming services and the way that people are watching streaming sp or live sports, mm -hmm. not just you know, the individual streaming apps, but also you have the different skinny bundles like we talked about last time, right? The Sling TVs of the world, the Fubos of the world, uh, DirecTV Stream, in addition to those apps. Well, now it becomes a lot more challenging. If you want to be in front of a sports audience, you now have to buy across multiple. Um, but you, why it creates an opportunity is because there's never been more ways if you do want to put your ads in front of uh, people that are watching live sports. Yeah, so if you've never, that's the opportunity, right? If you've never been able to like afford those spots before, mm -hmm. there are more ways in the door yeah. now if you haven't been able to do that before. So Jackie, so building on, you know, what's already started to take effect, what is the client response to this from yeah. your end? So, I mean, just feeding off of that, I have a perfect example of areas of opportunity for both sides that people haven't been able to have the budget previously. Mm -hmm. So our capabilities for CTV, um, we, in our back end, we do have generic deals. So if someone wanted to be on the NBA, the NFL, but if someone, say, mo more recently, one of my clients came to me and said, hey, you know, we're on linear, we're on the Eagles game, but we want to be streaming on the Eagles game in our geography. We want, you know, our ad to come across. So there was a couple of ways we could have done that, right? So uh, more budget friendly of someone that didn't want to, um, I'll start with what you, we can have the capabilities of a direct IO. So of specifically streaming on the Eagles game at that time. Then we, for more budget friendly, we can do day parting. Mm -hmm. So we select the deal of the streaming of the NFL network, say it is a Monday night 8 p.m. game. We take the hours, we turn that on only on Monday night during that time, maybe a little before, usually that's what we do. Um, and that way they have not a guaranteed, but they have an opportunity of where they can be streaming on the Eagles game in front of their geography, in front of the audience that they want to be on. Yeah. 
I just, I, from my perspective, I'm sitting in the seat. And if those of you who don't know Focus USA were, you know, a data and analytics company, all I'm hearing is so much first party data is now <laughs> bleeding into these platforms, right. which is just going to help create so much more of an opportunity down the line. Um, yep. So, so how are you helping them, you know, from the clients? Like, how are you actually setting their expectations, like in terms of these types of changes? So I think it's it's important to always be transparent with them um, and have an, an open conversation with them. First, talking about their budget and where they are mm -hmm. and the expectations of that based on um, the strategy of where they potentially want to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does take a little more explaining of exactly comparing it to the linear of all right, you're not going to exactly be, you know, shown at X time, you know, but you have the capabilities of being more cost effective in the targeting of the geography and being on this network. Again, I'm going to bring it up again for the, um, the direct buys. We do have that capabilities if the budget suffices to that. Yeah. So th there are there are so many ways to crack that egg, so right. to speak. And it's really just about evaluating, okay, this is what I've traditionally done on Linear for so many years. This is a new environment. I'm going to mm -hmm. trust my agency to do what's best for me, and here's the amount of money I can invest, right? Exactly. And, and I would just add to that, you know, I think that the way that we think about it with regard to live sports, because we get this uh, often. Mm -hmm. Clients will reach out, especially ones that are used to buying Linear TV that maybe have bought – from different run ads during different uh, events, mm -hmm. um, whether it be the NFL, NBA, NCAA, whatever, um, they'll be like, well, we want to just duplicate that in the streaming environment. Can we run during the Eagles game this Sunday? Uh, and so the way that we approach it is really two different buckets, which is pretty much what Jackie was describing, which is you know, the bucket where if, it is, if they want to run during the Eagles game, if they have a specific game, that they're interested in, in being in front of. Mm -hmm. Well, for something like that, you still need to do an IO. You still need to contact uh, whoever it is that's actually carrying the game. So let's use NBC as an example. Uh, you know, you're still going to contact NBC regardless of whether you're watching, you're buying it on linear or whether you're buying it in Connect TV. You're going to have an IO. It's going to look very similar to if you're buying linear. Obviously, with with connected TV, there's different metrics and different currency, which we'll get into. Yep. Uh, but that's one bucket. If it's very specific, you'll want to do a deal directly with the network to ensure guaranteed delivery. Whereas if it's a client that's just wanting to run during live sports and it's not as important that it's a specific game, uh, let's just say they want to run during college sports games. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can set up deals with uh, some of the other streaming services which carry live sports and carry college uh, sports and you could set up a private marketplace deal so that way you're going to be running across all college sports content mm -hmm. uh, programmatically, uh, but you're not going to have as much control as what you would get with a guaranteed I.O. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right, guys. So we have um, we did open this up to Coffee Insider questions uh, to come in. So we do we do have one that we're going to bring up right now. Mm -hmm. um, so this is from Anonymous. Should... Uh, CTV stand alone in my media plan in order to test it fairly, or should I incorporate it as part of a media strategy that has more measurability? What do we think? So, I, I mean, this is more so like a yes and no question, right? Mm -hmm. So, yes, you want to have it stand alone so that you can measure it alone, but also to understand that it's working you want to take a look at your grand, all of your digital that's running, mm -hmm. and test it and say, okay, I implemented my campaign on X state since then I've received this outcome. And see really if it is working. But to test it fairly as a CTV campaign, uh, the measurements of it, it needs to stand alone and you need to understand the analytics behind it and the monitoring behind it to see if it is working. And from there you can, again, because of the capabilities, you can make adjustments on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think that you know the way to look at it is very similar to how you would look at your linear buy traditionally. Uh, and why I say that is because it is effectively the same thing. 
it's, uh, it's on a TV screen, right? Mm -hmm. And so you should be looking at very similar metrics in terms of audience reached. Um, it's a branding uh, and awareness effective channel. Uh, and so the pricing also reflects the fact that it's on the big screen as opposed to uh, you're on your phone or your tablet. And so, you know, th in that respect, it should be looked at as its own tactic because it's very different if you're watching something on your TV screen and you're getting a commercial um, that's being streamed over Hulu versus if you're on the New York Times and you're getting a display banner, yeah. right? So, so it needs to be looked at in that context. Um, and video, even pre-roll video, is not the same as being on a TV screen. Um, and also, pre-roll video is typically on shorter form content, whereas mm -hmm. when you're talking about Connect TV, typically you're talking about l longer form, full episode player content. Um, but uh, to Jackie's point, uh, I think that it's, we always recommend looking at things holistically. Mm -hmm. So when we plan for our clients and what we recommend uh, you know, agencies plan and advertisers when they're planning, Look at the big picture. Where do each individual channel fit into the overall purchase funnel? And what are you trying to, to do, right? So, you know, how are you reaching people to drive awareness, get your message out there, tell a story? Connect TV is the best way to do that. Um, but, you know, once you've driven awareness, uh, you'll want to drive them down the purchase funnel by re-messaging them with different types of display banners, perhaps. Maybe you want to target them with a paid search ad, your social ad, right? And so they all the channels work together. And so if you're talking about how you should plan it, I think it's always important that you're not looking at it in silos, you're looking at the big picture and you're planning it holistically. Yeah, and I'm gonna add a third layer to this um, because there are so many ways that people can also do CTV buying, right? You can utilize first party data, you can do direct buys, you can do programmatic media. I think it depends highly on the audience. And I think that's something that needs to be taken into account in addition to how you are, you know, where your media is actually going to be served, yep. right? And I think that's true for any form of media. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Anonymous, I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much again for being a Coffee Insider. Um, and on we go. All right, so as we move forward um, into 2024, that's so weird to say even at the last day of January. Um, you know, whether you're advising or implementing CTV strategies for clients, there are a few things on the horizon this year um, that we now need to navigate moving forward that we didn't have to navigate in the past. You know, the big thing is, um, and we've been talking about it for what seems like a million years, but the inevitable loss of cookies. I think that's number one. Um, ongoing consumer privacy concerns, that's very big in my world, and it's overlapping now into this world as well. Um, and the consistent need to increase attribution and prove out conversions to our clients. Um, so, Andrew, let's talk about measurement and TV currency, all right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, those are big and important topics right now, especially, yeah. you know, those two go hand in hand, privacy and uh, cookies being sunset. Because mm -hmm. um, obviously cookies are being sunset in large part to be more privacy friendly to consumer. Uh, so it is, you know, what I think most people are agreeing, one of, if not the biggest change in our industry in terms of digital media that we perhaps have seen. Uh, you know, the business has been primarily built on top of cookies. Yeah. Um, with that being said, uh, it is a challenge that we're all going to have to face. Um, but the good news is, is that as far as connected TV is concerned, it is not a cookie based environment. And so uh, connect TV is primarily not targeted using cookies. Uh, it, there's a variety of different ways that people can target connected TV ads, um, but the data is largely derived from the smart device, uh, smart TV, uh, if it's a device ID or IP address or one of the other inherent language. Yeah, <laughs> one of the other um, device, one of the other identifiers that are inherent within Connect TV that are not inherent in other digital media channels, um, and so you know that is not going to impact connected TV very much in terms of the targeting capabilities, which obviously makes it a valuable channel to in invest in because you're still able to do targeting, not mm -hmm. without cookies. Um, now, with that being said, you asked about measurement. Yep. And measurement and currency are two really important topics right now 
in terms of the connected TV uh, landscape and uh, traditional TV buyers. And you know, I, I know it was a big topic at CES. I didn't go, but I heard. Um, but uh, I, you know, the reason why is because traditional TV has been bought and been measured very differently than connected TV, which is in the same sort of, um, you know, it's more like digital, okay. right? In, yeah. in terms of how it's bought. So it's CPMs are the way that, you know, digital has historically been bought. But with traditional TV, it's been bought based on GRPs. And so those are two different currencies. And so, you know, a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, what is gonna be the currency of the future? Because as people have migrated from traditional to streaming, you need to have a unified way of measuring both audiences because people still watch traditional TV. And so you know, that is an ongoing conversation. And what, what we're seeing is Nielsen has historically had a monopoly when it comes to the currency and measurement for traditional TV. Mm -hmm. But they did not necessarily adapt as well as what most TV programmers would like uh, to the changes that have been going on with streaming. Yeah. Um, and this was, it came to a head when the pandemic happened. Uh, they were undercounting their, uh, the, the program's audiences. And so that led to a, uh, a, their loss of the MRC, MRC uh, losing, loss of their accreditation, um, which for national TV ratings. And that was something they hung their hat on because they were the only ones yeah. uh, that had that. Um, and so I think what that did was it accelerated the conversations of alternative currencies. And what you see is um, companies that are more uh, forward-looking digital first companies like VideoAmp, iSpot, um, and uh, you know you have uh, like Samba TV, um, Nielsen's still playing a big role, and also Comscore. And they're all battling it out right now to figure out who's going to be the main currency, who's going to be the main measurement partner. Yeah, and until they figure that out, measurement is... Fragmented. <laughs> Our favorite word. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Aspect, yeah. <laughs> so um, while the battle royale continues, stay tuned. We'll continue to keep you updated. <laughs> I feel like we're live streaming a sports, right? Like the battle royale <laughs> of the measurement platforms um, that are out there. So so what do you think is going to happen then? Like moving forward, what do we need to what do we need to keep our pulse on? Yeah. So I think there are two different questions here. Right. Currency is very different than measurement when mm -hmm. it comes to um, TV. Uh, why they're very different is because currencies are just way harder, right? You need to have a consistent way of measuring uh, your TV viewership. And it needs to be for every buy across all, um, you know, no matter what program, no matter how they're watching it. And so it's much more complex and it needs to be consistent. And I think that that right now has not been really figured out 100% by anybody. Um, there are different ways, two of each one of these um, providers, which I mentioned, use for their measurement um, their, their uh, formula. Mm -hmm. So there's no consistency between them either. Of right? course not. A and so uh, you know, the data sources they use is also different. So traditionally, Nielsen has used uh, their panel-based. It's been based on broad demographic information. Uh, so they had C3 and C7. So that basically means how many people um, within the ages of 18 to 49 watched your program um, within seven days of it airing live, mm -hmm. right? That's how it's been bought and measured um, based on what percentage and what frequency uh, to that, in that demographic group. Um, whereas with, uh, with these advanced TV providers, they're using things like ACR, automated content recognition, yes. um, which is you know, built into the actual smart TV devices. So things like Roku, um, they're using set-top box data. Uh, and so there's a different methodology that they're using, which is, which they claim is more uh, accurate because it is a bigger sample size than the Nielsen panels, which has historically been maybe like five or 10% of the entire population. So it's really hard to say that that's representative of the entire mm -hmm. TV population. And so programmers are like, well, we're not getting our fair share, right? Because you're undercounting us. And so where I think things are gonna net out is where uh, you know, they had mentioned last week, which is three or four currencies yeah. uh, that are used. And I mean, I'm sure everybody hopes that, you know, there'll be one or two just to make things simple, uh, but that's still to be decided. Uh, and it will be in large part based on how consistent, who can get there first. Yeah, and I think 
that's the other thing. I, I don't really see a lot of them using the same forms of measurement, right? Somebody's going to use an 18 to 45 group. Somebody's going to be an 18 to 35 group. Like, I don't think it's ever going to be, you know, a consistent form of how they're even grouping these audiences together in terms of who looks like who. Um, so I think that's why it's going to be even more important to make sure that you're incorporating more than just one measurement partner. And, and an ironic thing is that Nielsen might actually win. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very difficult to get people to change from the status quo. Huh. And Nielsen is what they know. Yeah. So um, they are developing their own Nielsen 1 uh, ratings, which are across all screens. And it could very well be that if uh, a traditional TV buyer is used to Nielsen GRP ratings, well, it could be a very natural uh, you know, way for them to just add in their Neil Nielsen 1 ratings, mm -hmm. uh, which they know uses the same methodology, but also takes into account streaming. Man, oh man. Okay, so something to definitely pay attention to in 2024, and we'll make sure to connect with Andrew to keep you updated <laughs> <laughs> on his future predictions and as they come true. Um, so Jackie, can you actually piggyback on that and talk a little bit about how we need to be preparing clients to incorporate multiple measurement partners and what that's going to eventually look like for them? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be uh, the viewability standpoint of it. But again, I'm going back to the transparency of just having the conversation with the clients and making sure that the strategy is aligned with what they're their expectations are um, and then when it comes to in regards of the person behind it so for instance our agency um, making sure that we're always have the resources of the data the analytics and the collaboration and the partnerships for um, understanding and how to grow and combat anything that needs to be combated in the future mm -hmm. and, and I think just to piggyback off of that right we talked about the currency, but in terms of the measurement, what TV buyers are used to is seeing when did my ad ads play, what programs did they play, um, and that's something that hasn't always been available in the digital environment, right? especially when you're using technology like programmatic. Mm -hmm. um, but what it does require, and this is what we work together on, is, manu is a little bit of manual work right now. Right. So a combination of technological advances, mm -hmm. we have a report at basis um, called the CTV OTT report, which essentially what it does is it takes a very uh, just like complex can uh, report that you mm -hmm. will get once you run a CTV campaign, which is, has like a bunch of like different devices and different naming conventions. Uh, and it just groups those so that way it can be one consolidated report. Um, and for example, if you have multiple Pluto line items, it will group that into a singular line item. And so some of that you know, may require going through the data and sifting through it and being able to identify it. Um, and some of that could be done automa automatically. But um, we are making advances in that. And it also has a lot to do with how the campaign is set up to begin with. Mm -hmm. Because with private marketplace deals and with programmatic guaranteed, you know exactly who you're cutting a deal with. Mm -hmm. Whereas with programmatic, it's a little bit broader, and this goes back to what you said about that makes sense in certain situations, such as if it's very important who you're targeting, right? Yep. If you're using your first party data, maybe it's not as important as running on a specific uh, network like Hulu, and it's more important that you're targeting somebody who you know is your customer. Yeah. Um, so that will largely dictate the, the way the campaign set up and also what appears in the reporting. So much, so it all comes back to the data, people. <laughs> it all comes back to the data. <laughs> so um, another thing that we heard a lot about in the Winterberry Group report was uh, retail media. So retail media has been causing a lot of buzz lately, particular as third-party cookies continue to slowly make their way, make their exit. Um, so for marketers um, to potentially leverage actual shopper data across connected TV and tie the loop back to actual sales, right? The holy grail. The holy grail. <laughs> um, what do you see as the reality of that trend today? And how is that going to impact the future of how we're, we're building these programs out? No, I'm glad you asked that question, right? Because you're right. Re you see retail media everywhere. Uh, 
it, it's like, you know, the, the new shiny thing right now. And everybody's coming out with their own retail media network. It could be your local mom and pop shop. Apparently yeah. there are. Uh, everybody's getting in on the data game, people. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so, you know, when that happens, right, it's essential. It's not a new um, channel, but it is a new point of discussion. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not new that websites like Walmart.com have advertisements that they're selling to different advertisers and people that are, you know, purchasing like CPG companies that, you know, sell in Walmart. That's not new. Uh, but there have been advancements in the technology in terms of how you can use that data to target outside of the walls of Walmart.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the real holy grail is the ability to target people that are in market for your product based on the data that's collected on those websites. And then once you serve an ad to them, in a connected TV environment, uh, being able to actually tie that back to a sale mm-hmm. uh, and say, hey, this is the person I served, served an ad to, this is the uh, purchase that they made, that's true uh, return on ad spend. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is that the most retail media networks don't have the technology to be able to do that right now. I mean, even if they do, there's a disconnect between each one of them. So they don't share data because they're technically competitors, right? right. Walmart is not going to share data with Amazon. Uh, neither are they going to share data with Target. Amazon's not sharing data with anybody. With absolutely <laughs> anybody. And, and speaking of Amazon, I would say that Amazon is probably the only, um, maybe Amazon and Walmart, the only company right now who has advance of a tech stack to be able to truly do that, utilize shopper data, target them on a connected TV screen because they own Prime Video, which just came out with ads, Mm -hmm. uh, as we know. Um, And then they also are the platform which people are making the purchases too. So when you're using the same data to serve the ads on your platform, and then you have that logged in information about the consumer, you can then tie that individual back to the actual purchase. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, they are in a, a strong position to be able to do it. Uh, and Walmart, but the majority of the other ones, the other, uh, you know, retail media networks are partnering with tech companies. So like, for example, uh, Walmart made a deal with Roku. Oh yeah. So the ability to serve ads on Roku and then be able to utilize Walmart data and then also see if somebody made a purchase. Uh, Instacart, uh, made a, a deal, I believe with, um, uh, I think it was Roku as well. Um, but you're seeing these tie ups. And, uh, you know, the objective is for everyone to be able to do that, to tie that back. But the reality is not really like that right now. And I do think there will be a day where that is a possibility across most of these retail media networks. But it's important to, you know, keep that expectation in, in line when uh, you are planning across these different retail media networks while taking into account that they're very disconnected. So it'll be very difficult to measure across all of them. And it doesn't help that they also use different metrics. So what I'm hearing is fragmentation continued, <laughs> um, but still the measurability is getting more. We're, we're making strides, right? Baby steps are making strides. It's just, I think, when again, when anybody's looking at a challenge in terms of data sharing, there's so many layers to that, right? There's so many layers of this is my proprietary information. There's no incentive for people to share data. And privacy laws, consumers do not want you to do this either. So making sure that you have the right consent in place. Um, so Jackie, 2024 is also primed as a really big year for advertisers for a couple of other reasons, mm-hmm. right? There's opportunities that are going to be made available because it's an election year. Yep. Um, that's going to be continued to be compounded with the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And with these events already in motion, how can we actually optimize performance on right. our campaigns, but also really keeping in mind that we have to keep budgets in line? Right. So, okay. Okay. So this is going to be a big year, Um, just in regards to ad spend and um, the market overall. It's going to increase significantly because of election and because of the Olympics. The advertising as a whole is just going to increase. Um, Two ways now, if we want to focus, right, of a client saying, I want to partake in advertising during the Olympics, right? And there isn't, say, the budget isn't as significant to support it. So there's a couple ways around it. Um, just, again, I brought, I brought up day parting. So ad scheduling, say you want it during higher engagement, you're 
um, setting time up during that time for your ad to show. Um, again, if you don't want to be shown during that time, say, you know, I want to be on CNN, but I don't want to be on during the debates, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to block that time out. Um, I think it's also important, uh, again, just as a marketer, to always keep in mind the analytics and monitoring these campaigns during this time because a lot can change, a lot can get expensive. And if that's the case, then you want to reallocate the budget um, in order to make sure that the campaign is staying efficient and the budget is getting what it should be for the outcome of the metrics of the campaign. And then um, in relation, I know we talked in our other podcasts about the creative aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot can go into the creative in regards to either the Olympics or the election year. So even having a relevant message to your audience in the time of world events that's going on would play a role, um, as well as making sure, again, there could be a chance of ad fatigue happening. There's a higher engagement. So making sure that there is monitoring on that and having A-B testing potentially being one of uh, the strategies that you could um, implement for this time. Yeah, uh, there, there, again, the frat, there's so many ways to, to crack that nugget, <laughs> so to speak, yeah. but it's just one of those things where it's just really important to keep in mind that while ad spend is going to go through the roof this year, we are still competing for those same screens. Yeah. Right, that's and why you need an agency. that's why you need an agency um, and a great tech partner and a great data partner. So <laughs> here we are. Um, so, okay, we have another client question. Thank you again, Coffee Insiders, for your submissions. Uh, we're gonna pull that up now. So, one of their questions is, what is the recommended approach for discussing t uh, budget allocation for CTV with our clients? We have clients with varying needs. Some require immediate. Uh, ROAs, while others are more open to testing different strategies. How can we effectively collaborate with these clients who have limited budget flexibility and a limited capacity for experimentation and learning? Okay, so this is not a new question, right? Thank you for your submission, but I think this is something that agency partners are probably facing mm -hmm. consistently and will, con will face consistently more throughout 2024. What do we think? I agree. Um, I mean, I think it also, like the trial and error, especially if someone is looking for um, immediate return and they don't have the budget for it, then you want to have a stricter strategy if they want to be on CTV. Mm -hmm. um, for people that want to experiment, then it's open, right? You can try different targeting capabilities, different private marketplace, geography, even creative testing, right? But for someone that does have that restriction, you want to get to the point of who is your audience and how are they going to react? Because those two are totally separate campaigns um, and they're going to have totally separate numbers in return for that. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, an, uh, it's an important point, right? Because especially when you are partnering with a lot of mid-market agencies or mid-market advertisers, like I know we all do here, uh, you you want to make the you want to stretch your budget out as much as possible, right? And with mm -hmm. connected TV being a more expensive ad format, mm -hmm. you need a bigger budget to be able to deliver a statistic uh, enough impressions to have a statistically significant um, impact on your brand or your, or your business. And you know that re that requires more money, you know, higher rate, lower impressions, right? And so. You know, I think that a lot of what you mentioned earlier, Jackie, makes a lot of sense with regard to how you're targeting your ads. If you are doing a very hyper-located, lo local, targeted, uh, geo-fencing uh, type of campaign, if you only want to target these specific markets, for example, you might not need as big of a budget as if you're targeting a national buy, mm -hmm. right? You're just covering a lot of a, a larger area. And the more targeted that you get, the less your scale is going to be, but also that aligns with a smaller budget because you're honing in on exactly who you want to put your ads in front of. And so therefore, you first of all, you won't have as many people to be able to reach, but you can also get more from that budget by being very specifically targeted. And you know, all of those factors that you mentioned earlier, Jackie, are, are brought into play. Things like uh, your geotargeting, things like your frequency, things like your day parting. And 
by having an agency that can build the strategy behind it, it allows you to have um, creative ways to put your ads during the Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. If you know that the specific events are taking place uh, at certain times, you can set up your day parting to set, be um, you know, run during those times. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, bigger the area, the bigger the budget, smaller the area, the less budget. I would recommend at least for a national buy 10K a month for Connect TV, whereas you could get away with 5K a month probably if it's a very hyper-targeted uh, you know, Connect TV campaign. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to targeting it with ROAS, um, that is going to be a challenge for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. The technology of tying the impression back to the actual conversion, you're, it just, it's not really there with connected TV. You can't click on a TV screen right. and go to your site. There are new things like QR codes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not new. That's, that's direct marketing <laughs> QR codes 101. are not new, but it is new <laughs> in a connected TV environment. That's true. There are new formats, that's things true. like pause ads, which actually allow a consumer to go to your site, and mm -hmm. you could attribute it that regard. But, I mean, come on, how many people are really, uh, you know, scanning QR codes right now on their TV screen? So I think that, you know, it's in a place where you still want to stick to lower funnel tactics when, when ROAS is super important to you because it allows you to serve more impressions to the right audience at a lower budget and also gives you the ability to direct people directly to your site to actually drive those conversions and then attribute it as well. Yeah, I think the other point, again, to keep in mind is that you know, point of entry is still lower on CTV than it is with most linear buys. So that's taking us back to like the top of the segment, right? Like, and it's, it is more measurable than like a linear buy. Mm -hmm. So depending, which, measurable at all. which is not measurable at all, um, especially not with the change in currency that we know is coming. So I think that's really important to kind of keep in mind as well. All right. So before we run out of time, let's get into our predictions for 2024. Um, you know, looking ahead, measurement we talked about is going to continue to be a moving target, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, we're going to have to include multiple attribution partners and tactics, and um, all of that's going to be needed to be adopted by marketers, you know, this year and moving forward. <laughs> um, so the other big thing that people are talking about is bundling, right? Bundling seems like it's here to stay. I think that's going to continue to be a thing. Um, and I think that's just going to drive prices, right, for these streaming services moving forward. And as prices continue to increase, I think we're going to see more and more bundling, especially with the adoption of the live sports streams. So, Andrew, with all of that in mind, what can we expect in terms of consolidation and bundling for the yeah. future? Yeah, so, uh, again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, they're all related. Right. So if I am required to have Peacock as well as Netflix, if I'm a WWE fan as well as an NFL fan, well, then, you know, I can no longer get away with ha get away with having only like one or two streaming networks to be able to watch all my live sports. Right. And so, you know, that is going to, in my opinion, lead to more bundling, more consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, there is data that shows that the average consumer is willing to spend about $60 a month on streaming services. Now, that's still cheaper than the 105 which is what cable averages um, a month. Mm -hmm. So it's still cheaper, um, but what that really nets out to be uh, is about four, four streaming services per person. With uh, password sharing, if that does get rolled out, crackdowns rolled out to more and more streaming services, mm -hmm. then that may change, right? Because I don't know about you guys, but I'm on like five different streaming services that are not mine. everything. <laughs> and I pay for yeah. everything. <laughs> now, if I had to pay for every one of them, perhaps I wouldn't have Paramount Plus. No offense to Paramount. I mean, I'm just <laughs> saying that brands. it's Come only on. so much that you're going to be willing to spend. And speaking yeah. of Paramount, they've been in the news a lot lately mm. um, as a potential acquisition target. So, you know, we've already seen a lot of bundling and, and consolidation. Um, when it comes to consolidation, Disney completed their purchase of Hulu, uh, Max combined HBO and uh, Discovery. Then you have, um, you know, Paramount and Showtime. We, we talked about a lot of that last time. Yep. Um, that may continue uh, going forward where some of these streaming services, especially the longer tail ones, they just combine, they purchase each other, and it ultimately ends up to be like maybe four main streaming services, four or five, right? Netflix isn't going anywhere. Disney isn't going anywhere. Max isn't going anywhere. Peacock and Paramount probably. And they'll probably just buy everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> and then you also have Amazon and Apple, right? So um, I think that will largely be driven by those trends of the 
live sports exclusive exclusivity um and then you know what the consumer what's also pushing consumers towards the ad supported streaming apps is they're raising prices of the most expensive tier mm -hmm. and so they're trying to encourage people to move over to these uh, streaming apps and we have seen that happen that i would predict there to be an explosion in ad supported uh video on demand uh streaming services yeah. uh, so netflix and disney just released theirs uh, netflix came out with their now at 23 million uh subscribers uh, that's up from 15 million just from November, expecting like another 13 million this year. Uh, Disney is also uh, pushing people towards their app. They're coming out with a merged app. Um, when it comes to bundling though, that is very interesting because what you have is, is both broadcasters, broadcast uh, broadband providers, I should say. So like Verizon and T-Mobile, mm -hmm. they're offering as part of their package, uh, Max and Netflix uh, at the uh, $10 to get access to both. Uh, and T-Mobile, same thing. So they're, they're partnering with them. And then broadband, we obviously know what happened with Charter and Disney. Yes. Uh, so um, it'll be very interesting. I do expect there to be a continuation as the pay TV providers look to um, increase the monetization with their, with their viewership going down. They'll be setting up more of these deals. And uh, it seems like uh, there are also going to be plenty of those uh, broadband partnerships with Verizon, the T-Mobiles, AT&T, that are just bound to set up also uh, those agreements. Yeah, I mean, those few dollars a month make a big difference, right, when you're when you're choosing ad-supported versus not, um, which means that my kids might find out what a commercial is pretty <laughs> soon. That's okay. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, they would find out eventually from, like, TikTok, right, uh, or YouTube. YouTube kids is, <laughs> like, where we're at. They haven't... <laughs> haven't graduated to TikTok quite yet, thank goodness. Leave them on there for as long as you can. <laughs> so, Jackie, um, all roads will continue to point towards fragmentation. Yeah. Um, how do you think this is going to evolve, and what should we be positioning ourselves for and our clients? And just letting you know, we have a few more minutes. Yeah, okay. So I'll try and make it quick. Okay. Um, <laughs> As we mentioned, there's a lot of areas of fragmentation um, in regards to CTV. So it is important to understand that there are different areas that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. So one being could be cross device, right? Targeting. Uh, another could be data, like looking at audience. Um, and then another is looking at the partnerships. I mean, all of the bundling and everything. There, for a marketer, we're going to continue to evolve in this area as we do as a whole mm -hmm. um, in the industry already. But more specifically, as it continues to work itself out over the areas of fragmentation, it's the continued of learning and adapting to what is working and what isn't and then what is new and trying it out and seeing if it is working. But it there's a lot of areas that goes into it, right? Because yeah. we did talk about, we talked about the fragmentation of the creative. We talked about the fragmentation of the audience. And now there's the fragmentation of the different networks and the metrics evolving on it, um, surrounding it. But it's just as a whole, as a marketer, knowing that, understanding it, and continuing to adapt and learn as these big changes happen in the CTV. Yeah. I'll just hit on one real quick example of what we're doing. Um, we're, we recently came out with something called Curated PMP Deal Groups, okay. which is basically just grouping up these PMP deals, mm -hmm. which are all in the same category, right? So like live sports, we okay. have like 15, 15 different live sports PMPs. Rather than having to add each one to a plan, you could just select the live sports deal group mm -hmm. and you can create your own. This is another way to be able to streamline the setup for Connect TV, getting the scale of multiple CTV providers without having to have a thousand line items. It's Thank you for that shameless thing. plug. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now that we've uh, gone over Andrew's sales pitch, um, <laughs> let's also let's also take a look at like as we close out. What are our future predictions uh, for 2024? What are we thinking, Andrew? Do you want to close um, us out? Well, political uh, is going to be nuts. Uh, hopefully, you don't mm -hmm. live in a swing state. You will not stop seeing ads. They spend so much money. Um, it's it's gonna get crazy. By the way, Meg's shameless plug. Check out our new mover year end review, and then we'll tell you yeah, who's moving was, to those swing states. <laughs> that was a great report. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I th I think so too, and I think uh, we're gonna see a, the whole, especially ads, 
I think we might pass kind of what our thoughts are right now for our predictions. And live sports is a totally different animal that is going to com continue to evolve. Yeah, that's a <laughs> video on demand is going to explode. Uh, just, I mean, with Prime Video, they have 115 million subscribers already. Yeah. Netflix getting going, Disney going. Um, this this increasing price of premium is working. Who knew? Uh, people don't want to spend twenty dollars a month for one service, right? That's true. That's so that's true. just gonna go crazy. The scale is gonna go nuts. Um, you know, you'll see a lot more changes like in the back half of this year and heading into twenty twenty five. Thank you guys so much. Thank All you. right, guys. Thank you again for another amazing Coffee and Conversions. We're really excited that everybody was here to join us live. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to catch the live version, our on-demand will be up uh, in about a week or so. Guys, thank you so much. Thank again, you. one more thing. If you're not already a Coffee Insider, you can subscribe and join the club. There's a QR code on your screen to make sure that you can stay up to date on future events and insights. And until next time, folks, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.